Rear Admiral Lawrence C. Chambers, United States Navy, retired, United States Naval Academy, class of 1952. Rear Admiral James R. Hogg, United States Navy, retired, United States Naval Academy, class of 1956. Major General Charles F. Bolden, Jr., United States Marine Corps, retired, United States Naval Academy, class of 1968. Mr. Stephen S. Reinemann, United States Naval Academy, class of 1970. Admiral Timothy J. Keating, United States Navy, retired, United States Naval Academy, class of 1971. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. I want to thank you all and thank John for affording me the incredible honor of accepting this award on his behalf. I often get asked, after eight years as Vice President, what are the proudest and most meaningful moments I had? Two of them were being able to be the commencement speaker at two of your graduations, as well as at West Point and the Air Force Academy. You are an incredible group of young women and men. And the nation looks to you. And they hope that you emulate, emulate the conduct of the men being honored here today. All of you who know John, particularly his sister Sandy, who's here, knows how badly, and I mean badly, John wanted to be back home today, home meaning the Academy, to accept this award. For this award means more to John than words can say. This place, this place of honor, duty, service, tradition, is where John's heart resides. John and my colleagues in the Senate always used to kid me about always quoting Irish poets. They think I do it because I'm Irish. It's not the reason. I do it because they're the best poets in the world. <laughs> One of the famous Irish poets said, when I die, Dublin will be written on my heart. When John dies, the Academy be written on his. He genuinely wishes he could have been here. Beyond our loyalty and love for one another, 
There's one more thing John and I have in common, our academic records, <laughs> placing class. Both of us learn the hard way, learn from experience, but although placing class is important, thank God it's not ultimately determinative. <laughs> We both barely avoided me in law school and John at the academy being the goat of our class. If John were here today, I can assure you he'd say the only folks more surprised at his receiving this Naval Academy's Distinguished Graduate Award would be his fellow classmates who are here today. Can I ask, as we used to say in the Senate, a point of personal privilege, would his classmates please stand? What I can tell you without even knowing his fellow classmates is that they are not surprised that John has lived a life of honor, decency, duty, and devotion to his country, like few others have in modern American history. In 1993, John was your commencement speaker here at the Academy. And in that speech, he said to the graduating class, and I quote, you have been inducted into a tradition where you are expected to hold the highest standards of honor in every aspect of your life. That is your advantage over other men and women. Mess afloat and the type commander's E. Larry assumed command of the carrier Midway. In April, after the fall of Saigon, his ship supported Operation Frequent Wind, the evacuation of U.S. and South Vietnamese personnel. The flight deck was full of helicopters transporting refugees. Major Bung Lee, an experienced South Vietnamese pilot with his wife and five children in a two-seater aircraft, dropped a note requesting the carrier make room for him to land. In addition to other preparations, Larry ordered a number of helicopters pushed overboard to clear the way for the small aircraft, which then landed safely aboard the Midway to the widespread cheers of the crew. In 1977, he became the first African-American Naval Academy graduate promoted to Rear Admiral. He served as Assistant Chief of Navy Personnel, then commanded Carrier Strike Group 3, and later served as Interim Commander of Carrier Strike Group 4. His final naval assignment was Vice Commander of Naval Air System Command. Larry retired as a Rear Admiral in 1984 after 32 years of service. He then served as Director of Navy Marketing for Systems Development Corporation, which later became Unisys. He held senior program management positions with the company over the next 10 years. As a consultant, he traveled to Kazakhstan, providing classified services for the Defense Nuclear Agency. He was employed as president of Innova Systems and then worked for its parent company, Kinovic, for six years, where he traveled around the world to renew business relationships in the Far East and Pacific. Larry is an avid supporter of the USS Midway Museum. He travels to San Diego annually, where he speaks at civic and youth events, supports Midway's charity golf tournament, which is named in his honor, and assists in the museum's community outreach. He is also active with his local community leadership in Florida. As a staunch supporter of the Naval Academy, he speaks at engagements across the country, including Naval War College presentations, local area association events, and the Academy's Black History Month activities. Start off and tell you 
All my life, I always dreaded following great speakers. <laughs> I was in Detroit. I followed two great speeches. And I volunteered that I would never follow a great guy again, so here I am. <laughs> Distinguished guests, classmates, and especially the midshipmen, good afternoon. I am extremely grateful for the opportunity to be part of this group today. And I accept this honor with a sense of overwhelming humility. I have had the opportunity to review the remarks of previous DGA ceremonies. I even watched the video of my classmate, Joan Tom Stafford. He talked about aptitude, attitude, and altitude. Well, what do you expect from a world-famous astronaut? <laughs> I watched Admiral Mullen's presentation. He spoke like the professional presenter and the competent leader that he is. All of the videos showed men with greater accomplishment than any of mine, and inspiring messages delivered in a finer style than this boy from 7th and T could ever muster. You must understand, I never expected to be here today. I never really expected to be here 70 years ago. And I want you to think about that for a second. That's before your parents were born. <laughs> if it hadn't been for Congressman William Levi Dawson of Illinois, who's years later Dawson. also nominated uh, uh, Charles Bowden. I would never ever have been able to take the exemptions exam. And if the first 29 of Congressman Dawson's nominees had not failed the exam, <laughs> I, the 29th alternate, would never have been here at all, despite an outstanding scholastic record at my segregated high school in Washington, D.C. Those were a different times. We all ride on the shoulders of those who have come before us. The Golden Thirteen, Admiral Sam Gregory, my good friend, a great naval officer who inspired me my entire career. And I wouldn't be here today if without the encouragement of Karen Miller, and Ron Casey, both of the class of 75, who came to me in the fall of 2016 after a football game in Tampa between Navy and USF, Navy lost, <laughs> and encouraged me to allow them to pursue this honor for me. I also have to tell you that without the guidance and support of my classmates, Jim Sagerholm and Jack Young, class president of 52, and the persistence of my wife, Sarah, who, by the way, prepared the nomination package, I surely wouldn't be here today. <laughs> when I was accepted at the academy, my greatest aspiration as a plea was to make it through the first year. And every year thereafter, I had the goal of just trying to get it one day at a time. In my plea year, there were a minority of two. Reeves Taylor and I were the only African Americans in our class. Wesley Brown, the first of us to graduate, was my first classmate. When he left and Reeves uh, had the misfortune of winding up in the class of 53. I was just one African American and a thousand other mids in my class. Somehow, one day at a time, I made it through all four years. In my infinite wisdom, I requested a small boy for my first at sea assignment. 
thinking that a destroyer would give me the opportunity to show off my skills and training. But the Commandant of Miss Shipman, Captain Buchanan, class of 26, I know that's a long time ago, mm -hmm. called me in and told me I was being assigned to the USS Columbus under the command of his classmate, Captain Gordon Campbell. Needless to say, I was not happy. And I thought he was prejudiced against me. But like so many things when you're young, I was wrong. Actually, I was being mentored by Captain Buchanan, who was sending me to my first assignment under the watchful eye of his good friend and classmate. They were determined that despite the obvious problems that a young African-American officer could have in those days, nothing bad was going to happen on their watch. In retrospect, I was mentored and supported throughout my time here. And although I didn't realize it at the time, I owe much to the Academy for the many gifts bestowed upon me. In Columbus, I was assigned to the 1st Division, whose responsibilities included the starboard side of the forecastle and the number one main battery. My first day at sea, I showed up on time and ready to take over. That is when I learned the first important lesson that I want to convey to you. It was a lesson in humility. When I reported to that turret, there was only one person in there. It was Chief Baker. He looked old and tough, and he said, and I quote, Look here, Sonny. This is my turret. You keep the X off my ass, and I'll make you look good. <laughs> we will be the best run division on the ship. Much abashed, I did what he said. <laughs> Lo and behold, we had the best performance and the lowest disciplinary rate of any division in Columbus. My turret won the E. It was the first of several I achieved in my career. And every time I won an E, I did it by applying the lessons of teamwork and cooperation that Chief Baker taught me in just a few words and lots of examples all those years ago. Lesson number one is humility. Never let it get away from you, no matter how high you climb. When you go to your assignment, you will be fortunate to be served with enlisted personnel who are dedicated, knowledgeable, and capable. They deserve your respect and cooperation. When you take care of them, they will take care of you. Lesson number two is leadership through teamwork. The third lesson is about integrity. Without it, you're a nobody. Without it, an organization is nothing. Integrity is the foundation of truth and honor. I learned it at home. I studied in ethics class under Captain Tausig a Navy Cross and Purple Heart recipient who had lost a leg in the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. We were steeped in a tradition of integrity here at the Academy. Years later, when faced with the choice of having the Navy's shortest command tour as a carrier skipper, after defying an admiral, Admiral's order to let that Cessna ditch in the South China Sea. <laughs> I remembered my ethnic training from Captain Joe Tassi, and I gave the order to make a ready deck. All hands not on watch, including the air wing JOs, the Marines, and the snipes leaped into action to help the Air Force make a ready deck. It was obviously the right thing to do. As more and more helos went over the slide, I thought, they may court-martial me, 
court martial me for disobeying orders and for the destruction of government property, but not for letting women and children drown. That event occurred in the midst of the chaos of the evacuation of Saigon in the closing days of the Vietnam War. Moments after that bird dog landed, I went on to the next crisis and to give that much thought for years. Now, more than 40 years later, that one ethical decision seems to be the thing I am best known for. Much to my surprise, that story is found in a number of places on the internet. I'm not famous because I was the first Ameri African American to do this or that. <laughs> and not because I am a graduate of this prestigious academy, or a great carrier skipper, a great carrier pilot, or a talented in engineer. When I am asked to speak in front of military and civilian groups, I am often asked to relate the story of that fateful day when a ship under my command, dedicated to doing the right thing, saved seven lives. I have a prepared speech, but I'm going to start off and tell you, all my life, I always dreaded following great speakers. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Detroit, and I followed two great speeches. When I volunteered, I would never follow a great guy again, so here I am. <laughs> Distinguished guests, classmates, and especially the midshipmen. Good afternoon. I am extremely grateful for the opportunity to be part of this group today. And I accept this honor with a sense of overwhelming humility. I have had the opportunity to review the remarks of previous DGA ceremonies. I even watched the video of my classmate, Joan Tom Stafford. He talked about aptitude, attitude, and altitude. Well, what do you expect from a world-famous astronaut? <laughs> I watched Admiral Mullen's presentation. He spoke like the professional presenter and the competent leader that he is. All of the videos showed men with greater accomplishment than any of mine and inspiring messages delivered in a finer style than this boy from 7th and T could ever muster. Okay. You must understand, I never expected to be here today. I never really expected to be here 70 years ago. <laughs> and I want you to think about that for a second. That's before your parents were born. <laughs> if it hadn't been for Congressman William Levi Dawson of Illinois, who years later also nominated uh, uh, Chuck Bowden. Yeah. I would never ever have been able to take the exemptions to that. And if the first 29 of Congressman Dawson's nominees had not failed the exam, mm -hmm. I, the 29th alternate, <laughs> would never have been here at all despite an outstanding scholastic record at my segregated high school in Washington, D.C. Those were different times. We all ride on the shoulders of those who have come before us. The Golden Thirteen, Admiral Sam Gregory, my good friend, a great naval officer, who inspired me my entire career. And I wouldn't be here today if, without the encouragement of Karen Miller and Ron Casey, both of the class of 75, who came to me in the fall of 2016 after a football game in Tampa between Navy and USF, Navy lost. <laughs> and encourage me to allow them to pursue this honor for me. I also have to tell you that without the guidance and support of my classmates, Jim Sagerholm and Jack Young, 
class president of 52, and the persistence of my wife, Sarah, who, by the way, prepared the nomination package. I surely wouldn't be here today. <laughs> when I was accepted at the Academy, my greatest aspiration as a plea was to make it through the first year. And every year thereafter, I had the goal of just trying to get it one day at a time. In my plea year, there were a minority of two. Reeves, Taylor, and I were the only African Americans in our class. Wesley Brown, the first of us to graduate, was my first classmate. When he left and Reeves uh, had the misfortune of winding up in the class of 53. I was just one African American and a thousand other mids in my class. Somehow, one day at a time, I made it through all four years. In my infinite wisdom, I requested a small board for my first at sea assignment, thinking that a destroyer would give me the opportunity to show off my skills and training. But the Commandant of Miss Shipman, Captain Buchanan, class of 26, I know that's a long time ago, mm -hmm. called me in and told me I was being assigned to the USS Columbus under the command of his classmate, Captain Gordon Campbell. Needless to say, I was not happy. Mm -hmm. And I thought he was prejudiced against me. But like so many things when you're young, I was wrong. Actually, I was being mentored by Captain Buchanan, who was sending me to my first assignment under the watchful eye of his good friend and classmate. They were determined that despite the obvious problem that a young African-American officer could have in those days, nothing bad was going to happen on their watch. In retrospect, I was mentored and supported throughout my time here. And although I didn't realize it at the time, I owe much to the Academy for the many gifts bestowed upon me. In Columbus, I was assigned to the First Division, whose responsibilities included the starboard side of the Vauxhall and the number one main battery. My first day at sea, I showed up on time, ready to take over. That is when I learned the first important lesson that I want to convey to you. It was a lesson in humility. When I reported to that turret, there was only one person in there. It was Chief Baker. He looked old and tough, and he said, and I quote, Look here, Sonny. This is my turn. You keep the X off my ass, and I'll make you look good. We will be the best run division on this ship. Much of ass, I did what he said. <laughs> Lo and behold, we had the best performance and the lowest disciplinary rate of any division in Columbus. Mm -hmm. My turret won the E. It was the first of several I achieved in my career. And every time I won an E, I did it by applying the lessons of teamwork and cooperation that Chief Baker taught me in just a few words and lots of examples all those years ago. Lesson number one is humility. Never let it get away from you, no matter how high you climb. When you go to your assignment, you will be fortunate to be served with enlisted personnel who are dedicated, knowledgeable, and capable. They deserve your respect and cooperation. When you take care of them, they will take care of you. 
Lesson number two is leadership through teamwork. The third lesson is about integrity. Without it, you're a nobody. Without it, an organization is nothing. Integrity is the foundation of truth and honor. I learned it at home. I studied in ethics class under Captain Towson, a Navy Cross and Purple Heart recipient who had lost a leg in the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. We were steeped in a tradition of integrity here at the Academy. Years later, when faced with the choice of having the Navy's shortest command tour as a carrier skipper, after defying an admiral, admiral's order to let that Cessna ditch in the South China Sea, I remembered my after training from Captain Joe Tassi, and I gave the order to make a ready deck. All hands not on watch, including the air wing JOs, the Marines, and the snipes leaped into action to help the Air Force make a ready deck. It was obviously the right thing to do. As more and more helos went over the side, I thought, they may court martial me for martial means, for disobeying orders, and for the destruction of government property, but not for letting women and children drown. That event occurred in the midst of the chaos of the evacuation of Saigon in the closing days of the Vietnam War. Moments after that bird dog landed, I went on to the next crisis, and to give that much thought for years, now more than 40 years, Later, that one ethical decision seems to be the thing I am best known for. Mm -hmm. Much to my surprise, that story is found in a number of places on the internet. Mm -hmm. I'm not famous because I was the first Ameri African American <laughs> to do this or that. <laughs> and not because I'm a graduate of this prestigious academy, or a great carrier skipper, a great carrier pilot, or a talented in engineer. When I am asked to speak in front of military and civilian groups, I am often asked to relate the story of that fateful day when a ship under my command dedicated to doing the right thing saved seven lives. Mm -hmm. Lesson number three, integrity. It will make your life a success no matter whatever else happens. Now just like all the men up here, I could tell sea stories all day long, but I noticed Sarah is giving me the look. And I know what hell that means. It's time to thank you for your attention and to sit down and let those young fellows over there, her father, have a turn. Thank you very much. Aww.